went looking for an American flag, one anywhere. I looked at every store in Camden County, um, no American flag to be found. And so in desperation, I drove to Brunswick hoping that there would be a different situation. And obviously those people up there were just as patriotic as we are. And there was not a flag to be found anywhere. But I remembered that Brunswick had a sewing department in their Walmart, and I can sew a little bit, and so I decided to go in there and buy me a yard of red, white, and blue. So I decided to make my own flag. I came back home, and I'd done that, and I tied it to either side of my Ford Aerostar van on the top rail so that when I drove down the road, I had old glory waving back there for the next three or four feet. And I'd done that for about a month because flag makers couldn't keep up with the demand of the flag being purchased. And at that day, I would have given a $100 bill if I'd have had it to had one because I wanted to show Al-Qaeda or anybody else, this is who I'm standing with, this is who I said I would serve with, and this is the country I believe in. And that's just, amen. It saddens me that we've reached a day now where we have people, whether they're teenagers, college students, professional athletes, or whatever, that seem to diss the American flag. I think it's shameful. And you say, well, Pastor, that's not for you to say. That's one of our First Amendment right to free speech. Hey, you've got a right to free speech, but you can't go down to the theater and yell fire in a theater that's crowded or even in here if there's not indeed a fire. So we can't take our liberty to the extreme, um, and, and I believe that's an extreme level, and I probably shouldn't even have gone that far, but I did. And I stand by it. So that's, that's how I am. That's how I feel. So it is a flag that I don't agree with everything that our, our, our country has done, our Supreme Court. I, I certainly don't believe in all that, but I guarantee you this. I pledge to, to fight and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I still today am in favor of this great country. And I believe God. Listen, we have been knocked down. Don't get me wrong. We're at a bad time right now. But I believe just because we've been knocked down, we are not knocked out. Amen? I believe that. Let me share with you today uh, a brand new series, and I want to thank you for being in the YOLO series. You only live once. It was great. <clears throat> what an awesome time we had. Today we launch a brand new series that will go about four weeks entitled um, Undefeated. Now, we can't really say that about our Wildcats anymore. And, hey, I'm down with you guys. Hey, I listen on the radio. I cried with you. And, and, and I'm not one to turn my jersey inside out or say otherwise. I still got the hats and the memorabilia, and I'll still be bowing my chest out saying wildcat proud and all of that good stuff. And I remember the 03 and the 08 and the 09 and the other ones when we came close. And so uh, the deal is this. Nobody stays on top forever. Are you with me? Say Amen. That's true. But nonetheless, the thing is, um, undefeated uh, is the title of our series. And just because we're in a bad season, just because, and I'm not talking about just the, the Wildcats, but I speak of the country, and I speak of you as a Christian, just because we've had setback, that does not mean we have accepted ultimate defeat. Let me share with you, I think that you need to know today one of the most important things that you could walk away and uh, having knowledge of is concerning the undefeated series and for you and I to live an undefeated life, the most important thing you need to know is the devil wants to control your mind. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil wants to control your mind. If he can control your mind... He can control your thoughts. If he can control your thoughts, he controls your actions. If he controls your actions, then he has played you as a pawn for whomever he wants you to play for. The Bible says if as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So one of you might say, I am defeated. And you are. Another might say, I am an overcomer. And you are. You say, now, Pastor, that seems real, uh, real flimsy to say it that way. No, no, no. As you believe in your heart, so you become. So if you constantly think, this is, this is what I am, then guess what? There you are. 10, 12 years ago, uh, when Camden was making its run for the first state title, I'll never forget, we were approached 
to support the football team by some of the boosters. And we called ourselves the Kingsland Church of God at that time. KCOG was what it was. And we put a slogan on the footballs, and we paid six or $700 to have. I don't remember how many hundred of them. Because you remember the days when Camden was beating people 76 to 6. And, and I mean, they throwed more footballs than we had footballs. Are you with me? Say amen. Because every time we scored, they throw them out into the, and you and I would go out there and we would catch them and we'd just about kill people to catch a football. You know, you remember that? Well, we put on that football, our, our logo, and then we put a saying, a slogan that said, failure is not falling down. Failure is staying down. So what we were wanting the guys to know was just because you get knocked down, that's not Failure. Failure is when you just sort of lay there and say, well, it's just destiny. That's, I, I'm knocked down. I'm defeated. But no, when you decide to get back up again. How many of you ever watch boxing or UFC or, or, or some of these sports? I, I remember I used to like to watch boxing back in the Mike Tyson days and the Lennox Lewis and all of that. And, and, and you see a guy getting knocked down, and, and there he is. And the ref says, one, two, three. Four, and this guy on the ground, he's looking up and he's looking through the blood and the swelling of his eyes and the sweat and the tears and whatever else is there, and he can't hardly seven, eight, nine, and all of a sudden, about nine and a half, he springs back to his feet. Are you with me? See, sometimes staying down the whole nine seconds, that's just a ploy to rest for nine seconds to get all the rest you can and then pop right back up and go at it again. What you got to understand, sometimes if we've been knocked down, that don't mean we're knocked out. That means we're down right now, but we're going to come back and we're going to live to fight again. But I want you to know the devil wants to control your mind. You know, the, there's a lot of references in the Bible to the mind. And, and why is it important for you to know that the devil wants to control your mind? Here's why it's important for you to know that. Because in this six or eight inches between here and here, most battles are won and lost right there. You say, I thought it was, you know, where they caught the football. I thought it was where they, they knocked somebody out. No, right here, be, between the ears, right here, is when most battles are won and lost. And in your Christian life with the Lord Jesus Christ, most battles are lost and won right here. It is what you set your mind to do. You've heard someone say, but you, you know, they say, well, look at that little guy. He's so little, he ain't nothing. And they say, but you hadn't seen his heart. They have more fight. They have more heart. Listen, the Bible talks about a confused mind. The Bible talks about an anxious mind, an evil mind, a restless mind, rash and deluded. He talks about a troubled mind or a depraved mind, a sinful mind, a dull mind, a blinded mind, and a corrupt mind. But I remember a place where he said, but if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report. And he tells us to dwell on the Lord. Jesus Christ and set our affection and our mind on good things. Because as you think, so you are. You ever go into work and say, boy, I sure hate going to work today. It's going to be a bummer. I got to fire somebody. I got to, I got to eat the frog. I mean, I got to, that, eat the frog is a phrase I use where if you got to do some bad, terrible deed, write a terrible letter, have a terrible meeting, a terrible phone call, I say to our staff, eat the frog first. In other words, let that be the first thing on your agenda so that old frog don't have to sit there on the bookshelf and croak all day at you and you dread it and you have a sourpuss attitude all day. Go ahead and eat that frog if you know you got to eat him before 5 o'clock anyway. That ought to help some of y'all. Most battles are won and lost right here. They have the heart to win. Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church said this. There's a violent battle going on. It's raging around us 24 hours a day. He said, in 1965, Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote a book called The Invisible War. He said, in this battle for our mind, it is a vicious battle. It is an intense battle. It is an unrelenting battle. It is an unfair fair battle because Satan doesn't fight fair. He never has played fair. And the reason why it is so intense is that it is the greatest asset and it is his greatest tool to destroy you and that is in your mind. 
Because if he can get you to believe that you are defeated, you will act like you are defeated. You will talk like you are defeated. You will spoil other people's hope, other people's hopes of victory. Did you know misery loves company? Yes. But let me tell you this. In 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, here's what Paul said to the Corinthian church. He says, uh, for though we live in a world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient unto Christ. What he says is all the thoughts that come through our mind, we grab hold of that thought and we judge that thought by the word of God. If the devil says we can't, we look at it and find the word of God says we can. If the devil ran through our mind saying you're a loser, we look at this and it says we're a winner. If, if he says we are never going to be an overcomer, we look at this and it says we've already overcome. Matter of fact, let's just take a look. Uh, our job is to destroy the stronghold of the mind that the devil has come to set up. What is a stronghold, pastor? I'm glad you asked. It might be a mental block that you have. It could be an argument that is set up against the knowledge of God in your own mind. It could be a worldview such as materialism or hedonism, Darwinism, secularism, relativism, communism, or atheism either. Uh, listen, a stronghold could be even a personal attitude that you refuse to give up. Yeah, that one bounced a little bit. Uh, a personal attitude about something. Maybe it's seeking the approval of others and you can't get over seeking the approval of everybody else. Listen, I don't care how many people you make happy, you'll never make enough of them happy to make yourself feel good about yourself. Amen? But here's the real deal. If I can be true to him, if I can lay my head on my pillow at night and go to sleep knowing that I have been true to what God wanted me to do today, it really doesn't matter if I please you or not. Hold on, but worry could also be a stronghold. Some of you worried to death about your life. You're worried about your retirement. You're worried about your kids. You're worried about this and you're worried about that. In so much that you have no joy in the Lord because every waking moment is a worryation. It is always something. This is going to go bad. That's going to go bad. And you're going to have an ulcer. You, you, you're going to have a heart attack worrying to death about what might not happen. You need to do like a pastor I heard. He said, years and years ago, he said, I decided to, to make me a box. He said, I, every time I had something to worry about, I wrote it down on a sticky note, and I put it in a box. And I put that box on my desk, and I put Wednesday worry day. He said, I worried about everything on Wednesday. He said, I didn't, if it was Sunday, I didn't worry about it. I wrote it down, put it over to Wednesday. If it was Thursday, I didn't worry about it. I wrote it down, put it in there. And when Wednesday came, I worried about everything in the box. He said, but when I started reading everything in the box, 99% of them wasn't even in the box no more. I mean, it already fixed itself. He said, so it is a trick of the devil to get you to worry, to get your mind off of God so that you don't trust God, so that you don't believe God, so that you don't take advantage. Let me show you what Paul said to the Romans. See, stop living. What is, it? what is it that you need to do? Well, see, here's what you had to know is the devil wants your mind. You needed to know that because it is in the mind that you win and you lose. So what do I ask you to do today as a pastor? I'm asking you today to live like the conqueror Jesus Christ said you are. Some of y'all don't believe he said that, so I'm going to read it to you. Paul said to the Romans, he said this in 8 and 31. He said, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Huh? What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How he will not also along with him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against God's elect, whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? Who, uh, uh, no one, he says. Christ Jesus, 
who died. More than that, who was raised again to life. Guess where he's at? At the right hand of God. Guess what he's doing? Interceding for us. So he says in 35, then, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Why? Jesus is sitting right there at the Father. He's praying for us. So then he asked this rhetorical question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? He said, as it is written for your sakes, we face death all day long. In other words, the devil wants us to be cast down in our mind. He wants us to feel defeat. He said, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So I don't care what the devil wants you to think. I don't care. It looks like we face death all day long. Jesus Christ, our big brother, has said we are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved us. And that nothing can separate us. He said in verse 38, For I am now convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers that be, nor height nor depth, nor any other thing in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So hey, bow your chest out. You might be the wormiest thing. You might even stand eye to eye with Ken and Richard. I want you to bow yourself up and push the devil right back in his chest. And I want you to know, listen here, friend. You might not be scared of me, but I got a big brother. For the Bible says, as many as believed on God, gave he the power to become the sons of God. And my brother, Jesus Christ, will take care of you. Hello. So you think you're pushing me around. You gotta understand that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm not scared of you because I know who lives inside of me. I am his and he is mine. And when I am weak, he is strong. Oh my friend, if God be for me, who can be against me? Oh man. And then Paul would write on to the Corinthians and say this. To the Corinthian church, Paul would write this letter. He said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. See, the old devil wants you to think, yeah, man, you are, you are crushed down. You've been knocked down. You are perplexed. But Paul said, oh, yeah, we, 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 we've been pressed hard on every side. He said, but we ain't crushed. He said, yeah, we, uh, we're perplexed. What does that mean? Y'all have had that, that look of being let me use a South Georgia term. Power some confused. That's a brown town word. Huh? That's a redneck word. Well, we don't know what. We've been power some confused. He said we're perplexed. We don't know which way is up and we don't know which way is down. Like a fighter that got hit so hard, he's kind of dazed and sort of trying to get his sea legs. He said, I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. Did you hear that? He said, I'm persecuted. That means you've buffeted me. You've sent your friends to buffet me. Satan has buffeted me. Demons have buffeted me. He said, but I want you to know I'm not abandoned. It looks like I'm alone, but my Lord Jesus Christ is here. His name is Jehovah Shammah, and where I am there, he is also. Well, let, let me try to go on. But he said, I am persecuted. I realize your attack. I know that you're coming against me, but I'm not by myself. Oh, I can't help but run down this road, so y'all bear with me. Second service, I can do it if I like, I suppose. But nonetheless, I got thinking about uh, Elisha. Oh, Elisha was uh, surrounded by the Syrian army. King Ben-Hadad had put them out, and uh, they come down and surrounded his house because he had told the king of Israel every move that Syria was making. And finally, they got a GPS coordinates on his house, and they surrounded his whole house, the entire village, they surrounded it in the mountains. Ben-Hadad's army was there. And uh, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, heard that the Syrian army was around them. 
He walked out front one morning and looked into the mountains, and he said, oh, my, 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 my. He done like some of us, oh, my, 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 my. He, we are persecuted on every side. He ran back to Elisha, and he said, Elisha, master, I'm just trying to, I got to tell you, Ben-Hadad's army has surrounded us, and they stand shoulder to shoulder. They're all around us. We are cut off. There's nothing we can do. Here's the great prophet of the Lord that prayed for him and said, Oh, Lord, open thou my servant's eyes that he might see. Go back again and look and see what you see. Gehazi went back and pulled the shutters open again, and he looked. And yeah, they were still standing around there, but behind and above them stood the angels of the Lord with their wings spread. Amen. All around the whole mountain scene, he come back in there and he said, Elisha, Master, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I want to tell you something. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care how cast down you are, how persecuted you are, how perplexed you are. If God is for us, who can be against us? Don't lose heart. Oh, goodness. Y'all remember there was another story about Elisha. I told the first service, I might as well tell you. As a Shunammite woman that had a little boy, Elijah had, or Elisha had proph prophesied, and the boy was born. And one day they're out in the field, and the little boy said to his daddy, I don't know, he's eight or ten years old or something, my head, my head. And his daddy picked him up, and he does what all good daddies do, he takes him to his mama. And he took him to his mama, said, he said his head's hurting. And so she sat him on the couch, prayed for him and all of that. And about noontime he died on the couch. She called her servant and said, saddle up a couple donkeys. I got to go find the man of God. They saddled up one and she told uh, the guy, the servant, she said, don't you even ride slow for me. Most of the time they would ride slow for women that was riding because they didn't feel like they could quite handle the speed that the men. She said, don't you slow down on my account. We go into the man of God. Giddy up. So she took off to the man of God. When he got close to Elisha, here's Gehazi. He said, the woman looks like the run. I mean, I believe that is the Shunammite woman. And uh, he's, Elisha said, go to her and see what's what's." What's wrong? And holler at. So he, as he runs toward her, he says, is everything okay? Is all well? And here's the words of a mother who had a dead boy laying on her couch and was ever exercising every inch of faith she could muster and find. The man of God said, is it well? And she said, it is well. Oh, man. Where did I tell you this thing exists right here? It is in your mind. In her mind, she said, my boy lays on the couch dead, but it is well. How in the world can somebody say that? Somebody who has resolved that we're going to let the will of God be done regardless. If God raises him, praise God. I'm going to live on. If God takes him, I'm still going to live on. If it don't even turn out my way. But she had resolved in her mind, everything's okay. It is well. Is it well with you? Is it well with the boys? Is it well with your family? It is well. God restored that boy to life. So here's what the word says. I want to just read this to you. Verse 13 says, It is written, beloved, therefore I have spoken since we have the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore we speak. We also know that one that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us and present us with you to himself. And this is for your benefit that you know the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Verse 16, so important. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. He said, outwardly, outwardly we're wasting away. We're dying on the outside. This old body's going to give way and gravity's going to win. 
From dust thou art, and to dust we shall return. The dust will return to the ground from whence it come, and the Spirit back to God who gave it. But we don't lose heart in the outward repairs in day by day. For verse 17 says, Our light affliction and momentary troubles. <laughs> our light affliction and our momentary troubles are working for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What Paul is trying to picture for these people is that we're having hard times and we're struggling and our struggle is real. He said, but these are just light afflictions. And in the whole picture, in the whole scheme of things, God is working something for an eternal weight of glory that only when we get to that side will we know the beauty of it. See, in our finite minds, all we can comprehend is from the day we were born until the day we leave. We cannot comprehend the eternal weight of glory. We cannot comprehend that that is unfathomable. But he tells us, verse 18, so we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is uh, unseen. Since what is seen it's temporary, even in the mirror. Next time you look in the mirror, as pretty as you are, I want you to say, it's temporary. It's going away. And I don't mean that to be crude. I'm just simply saying I don't care how beautiful or handsome or hunkish you are. It's going away. Our spirit will live forever, but this old body's going back to the dust. Now, I, I know... Listen, let me just give you a little preview here. I know there will come a day when the trumpet of the Lord sounds and that old body that is in the dust will meet with that spirit that is in heaven with God and so shall we be changed and mortal will have put on immortality and corruptible will have now put on incorruption. And I believe you'll recognize me as Mike Sainz, but in a glorified body. One where the hair ain't never gonna turn loose no more. Amen. Where poison ivy won't have no more rain on my body. Amen? But it'll be in a perfect place. And I'll understand and know, even as I am known, I'll understand all the light afflictions and all the hard afflictions and why I didn't understand what I was going through on this earth. And there'll be a time on that side where I'll be able to spend the endless ages basking in the glory of an undefeated Savior. Lord, have mercy. I'm trying to tie it up. Our general overseer, Dr. Tim Hill, preached a message years ago. And I'll never forget it. The title of the message was Worn Out, But Still Going. And that's what some of you need to hear right now today. You wore out. I mean... You, You've taken everything you can take. War slap out. Don't know if you're going to make it tomorrow. Worn out, but still going. He had three points to that message. It was number one, when you're worn out, keep going. And he says this, the way to do it is don't lose your head. Don't lose your heart. And don't lose your hope. I wish I had time to preach that beautiful message to you, but I don't. Don't lose your don't lose your head, don't lose your heart, and don't lose your hope. I want to say this. As I close this today, I ask you to take the step and the action to live as a conqueror. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. To live as a conqueror. And here's what I want you to know about that. Living as a conqueror demonstrates our faith that we are what we say we are. That we are a conqueror. Just before I give this altar call, this is what I want to say. Nothing, nothing speaks more highly of what one believes than, one how, than how one lives their life. Nothing speaks more highly of what you believe than the actions you take. Jesus said we would know a tree by the fruit that it bears. Nothing speaks higher of you saying I'm a conqueror 
than you living like a conqueror, than you professing that you're a conqueror, that you push back against the devil and say, I am a conqueror. I'm an overcomer in this life. I know you've thrown every stone in hell at me. I know I've got trouble with my kids. I got trouble with my wife. I got trouble with the bank and with the attorneys and ain't no telling what else is going on. But I have put my faith in God. Let me tell you something. Jonah was running from the Lord. He had done everything he could do. He turned away from the presence of God and went down to Joppa and bought a ticket and headed to Tarsus. Running from the presence of the Lord. He said they threw him overboard. He went out of the boat, down into the sea, swallowed by a fish, down into her belly. He cried, the earth with her bars is about me forever. He said, my life has come before me. I'm perishing, here I am. He said, but there in the belly of hell cried I unto the Lord. And I looked again unto his holy hill. And he heard me by reason of my affliction. And he attended unto my cry. Are you hearing me? Wherever you're at, all you got to do is say, you know what, Lord? It's been bad, but I put my trust in you. And here's what I want you to do. Here's why you need to, to do this. Because how you live is more than what you say. You see, when, to say one thing is, to say something and not live it is a hypocrite. But to say, he is my Lord. God is for me. And then to live like you're, you know, beneath that. Nothing speaks more highly of what one believes than what one does. So as you step out of your seats right now and come, what I'm talking about is the truths that you embrace, the belief system that you subscribe to, the doctrines that you hold dear, the suffering that you're willing to endure. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, it's more than just words for me. I've been knocked down, but I tell you, I'm not knocked out. I've been perplexed, but I'm not in despair. As Adam sings this song, I want you to step out from where you are and fill this front area, this altar, in the name of Jesus. Come on right now. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The altar, the Put your trust in Him right now. As you get here, I just want you to slip your hands up into the air and just begin to pray to Him. Was born with the precious. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I need your touch.